what an amazing spread of food. I'm thinking we could feed the whole of Blenheim on that morning tea table. <laughs> Just spectacular and like baking probably is not one of my strengths or cooking you know like I do it because I love my family but um, and, and they need to be fed <laughs> my husband gave me a cartoon not long after we were married and it was a cartoon of um, a, ta a beautifully set table and people you know the two couples were sitting at it and it was just you know like the silver t silver set of cutlery and everything like that beautiful and in the middle of <laughs> The, the placing was a boiled egg <laughs> and the cartoon said the husband was speaking I'm so proud of my wife when we first got married all she could do was boil water <laughs> <laughs> anyway I want to start with um, a parable there was a man who had four sons he wanted his sons to learn not to judge things too quickly. So he sent them each on a quest in turn to go and look at a pear tree that was a great distance away. The first son went in winter, the second in the spring, the third in the summer, and the youngest in the autumn. When they'd all gone and returned, he called them together to describe what they'd seen. The first son said that the tree was ugly, bent, and twisted. The second son said it was covered with green buds and full of promise. The third son disagreed. He said it was laden with blossoms that smelled so sweet and looked so beautiful that it was the most graceful thing he'd ever seen. And the last son disagreed with all of them. He said it was ripe and drooping with fruit, full of life and fulfillment. The man then explained to his sons that they were all right because they had each seen only one season of the tree's life. And he told them that you cannot judge a tree or a person by only one season. That the essence of who they are and the pleasure, joy and love that come from that life can only be measured at the end when all the seasons are up. If you give up when it's winter, you'll miss the promise of your spring, the beauty of your summer and the fulfillment of your fall. Don't let the pain of one season destroy the joy of all the rest and don't judge life by one difficult season persevere through the difficult patches and better times will come for sure you can yes <laughs> uh, I love the different seasons in the year my personal preference would be to have hot all year round that would be you know <laughs> that's but uh, my husband would be absolutely distraught at that thought because he actually loves autumn and he loves winter as a season he doesn't mind being cold I don't like being cold I prefer hot give me hot um, but you see the things that helps us define where we are in our years some countries don't have seasons at all some are just constantly the one but in New Zealand we're very fortunate we do have four distinct seasons Except for Blenheim, maybe. I don't know whether Blenheim has. Do you have? You do? Okay. <laughs> Summer all the time there. Yeah. Blue skies all the time. You see, what happens with seasons is they, they inspire uh, anticipation. And they keep us flexible. And they help us process and manage change because seasons change. And we know every year there will be changes. I can, I, you know, as a little girl, I shifted around a lot. And I can remember the first time I lived in the same house for more than one year. And I can remember thinking, oh my goodness, I know what time of year it is. Because look, there are new buds starting to come. I'd never seen a full year in the same property. And it was like, oh, I know what's going to happen next. Because I've seen what's happened next already, you know. Um, in our, on our property, we've got some lovely trees. I'm very grateful. My husband's a gardener, and he does the gardening. And, you know, I live in a park, really. I, I'm very blessed. No, I'm, I'm serious. I live in a park because <laughs> that's his sideways passion when he comes home. That's, you know, he's in ministry, so you, you never see a finished task in ministry. But when he can come to the garden, he can prune things, and he can, you know, tidy things. And he, he, he just loves that. He, so... I, I'm the beneficiary <laughs> of his hard work. And we've got silver birch trees. We've got a coffer beech tree. We've got magnolia trees. We've got kofi trees. And uh, 
And all of these, those trees are deciduous. So, you know, there is a season that our property looks quite messy because those, all of a sudden, you know, I can remember one year in particular, I don't know why it happened this way, but our silver birch trees, we've got three of them. It was like within a week, all their leaves fell off. <laughs> it was like the whole ground was covered with these gold leaves. And it just like, and all of a sudden the tree itself looked barren and bleak and empty. And I'm thinking, wow, look at that. And so, you know, I, we have this natural picture. And if I were to think that that's what our property looked like all the time, if somebody came to my house that time and saw our property in that state, they'd think, oh, there's nothing much in this garden. But come to spring, I tell you, it's, it comes to life in spring. And we have azaleas and we have the magnolias and we have the freesias and we have the, the just everything, the, the camellias. Some of the camellias are coming into flower now. The different seasons, they come into flower. And so we have this incredible beauty that comes that if you, in fact, we, ha we had a friend staying with us last week who lives in Perth. And they don't have winter in Perth, really. Well, you know, they don't, and they don't have lots of, in Australia, wherever they are, they don't have lots of deciduous trees. So she saw some of our, like our leafless trees, and she said, oh, they did. <laughs> I said, no, 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 they're just deciduous. They just lose their leaves in winter. And it's great that they lose their leaves in winter for us because you don't have so much sun in winter. And so that when, the, when the, the, um, the sun is shining, you want it to be able to come in. And so when those leaves aren't there, at least it releases some of the sunlight to everything else. And so I'm grateful that they lose their leaves in winter because that whatever sun there is, is able to get through a wee bit more. And, but when, they, when it comes to summer and it is too hot, their leaves provide the shade. And I'm, you know, it's just, God is very clever, I've discovered. And so... Uh, we had a, um, a good friend of ours, Ruth, and it's uh, Pastor Helen McGee. I don't know if any of you know Pastor Helen McGee. She's a, a real, been a real mother in the faith to me in my growing up years as a, as a pastor and as a pastor's wife. And she used to share a message around the nation um, at the time. Um, I, I had her come and speak to our New Plymouth lady, so that's probably 16 years ago, maybe. And she used to do this message called Seasons of a Woman's Life. And she used to talk about the fact that there is a spring season, a summer season, an autumn season, and a winter season. And when we understood the season that we were in, or we would understand the season that other, you know, I can remember it making a whole lot of sense when she talked about the winter season, it helped me understand my mother a whole lot more. Because she talked about the fact that in the winter season, people are looking to leave an inheritance in their lives. They're looking to leave something of value because they know that their time is, is getting shorter. So that's why when you go to your, you know, your, your elderly mothers and they'll say, oh, why don't you have this cup, saucer and plate set, darling? You know, this used to be great aunt so-and-so's and, I, you know, I, 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 I don't need it anymore. I'd like you to take it. And I think, I don't want a cup, saucer and plate set. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why are you giving me your junk? You know, that's, you know that, that was what I was thinking at the time. <laughs> That's not junk, and I'm not being ungrateful. But you know, I un I didn't understand the winter season for her, and it made sense afterwards when I suddenly thought, "What you're wanting to do, Mum, is leave me a legacy of my past, because this was important from your past to you, and you want me to carry something of that legacy into my future as well." And you know, and it made sense. So now, you know, from then on in, I would gratefully receive from her the things that she wanted to pass on what I chose to do with them after I received them was another story sometimes because I, you know, but I received them because I res understood the heart of what she was wanting to portray and, and that made sense to me. Some of you who are in this, if, if um, being in the spring is a distant, <laughs> distant past where you were young and full of dreams and potential and you, you, you know, you thought you had forever to live in the world and you you had every freedom and choice ahead of you and you had dreams and thoughts of what you could become and you could do and then um, maybe you became married maybe you became a mother and you entered the a spring season a Easter summer season and you're constantly giving your physical your best of your physical strength years you you know just working hard those are working hard years and then once you come to the autumn years when your children are older and they're out of their home and it's, uh, there are things that um, 
you can rediscover yourself sometimes. You can discover the fruit that's in your life and you can look at those things. And then I've talked about the winter. That's just a very, you know, very condensed. Um, and in each of those seasons too, there are physical attributes that we journey with. You know, when, you, when you're a young girl and you come into maturity and you first get your periods and, and dealing with the emotions and the hormones and the changes and then when you're a, a mum and you're breastfeeding and you have those different hormones and you, you know, you're dealing with pregnancies and you know, I think there was a season where probably for six or seven years I was either pregnant or breastfeeding it felt like. You know, it's just your body was not your own for a lot of years. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> You know, and, and it's that, that season that you understand and then and then you get to your autumn years and you have the jolly, you know, menopausal things going on and you, you didn't you didn't get woken up by children anymore, but you get woken up by hot flushes and you think, when when is the season of, you know, physical change gonna change? It's just like you know, so it's like this whole understanding ourselves and this whole processes and then when you get to the winter season and you you know, you would love to sleep all night long, but you just you know, you wake up and you have long 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 nights sometimes because you don't seem to need the same lot of sleep but you don't have the energy to do the things that you wanted to do in the past but the truth is each season has its own significance and its own reason for being because God's ordained seasons I've discovered God set the parameters for seasons when we look in Genesis 8 verse 22 it says while the earth remains seed time and harvest Cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. In other words, you know, until, until the end of this planet happens, there will always be seasons. God has ordained seasons. So we need to rest and to work with the season we're in. Because, I, you know, I see sometimes that uh, some of our young women, they want to do everything now. You know, we're raising a generation of girls that we're encouraging them to say, you know, you can be anything, do anything you want. And then they hit being, you know, having a baby. And they're wanting to do everything and be everything and still have a baby and still work and still, you know, and it's just not quite that easy. And it's hard work. And... Uh, we need to pray for our Prime Minister because truthfully, you know, this journey that she's walking, I, I just don't envy the process for her because it's huge. And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, I want to say to you girls, the truth is that no woman is called to do everything all the time. I think we need to understand that there are seasons in our life. And now, you know, I'm in a season where I'm freer to travel and to do what I'm doing because I don't have the same constraints of looking after my children physically. I'm probably the sandwich generation right now because I have an aged father. My mum died just um, 18 months ago and my dad is 91 and so he's uh, um, mostly blind and he's in a rest home and so I have to travel four hours down to Waikanae I do that once a month to go and spend time with him and to look after him. And in between that, I'm looking after my grandchildren. We looked after our two of our New Plymouth grandchildren for 10 days over the school holidays <laughs> while their parents had a cruise for their 10th wedding anniversary. <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> trying not to be a little envious but anyway no we had um, and we had a delightful time I have to say and we had before we realized that you know when our daughter Rachel came said mum do you think you could go after the kids we want to do this cruise and I'm saying sure sure and then I looked at the calendar I'm thinking oh it's right when life conference is on and we usually go to life conference and we'd booked to go to life conference and it was on the school holidays this year and they had a children's program so I said okay we'll take them to life conference with us <laughs> So we took our little three-year-old and our little seven-year-old with us to live conference and I booked the accommodation and um, <laughs> I should have paid attention to one word. It said deluxe family, so I'm thinking, good, you know, four beds, all good. Studio. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> so all four of us slept in the same room. <laughs> 
Deluxely, I have to say. <laughs> so the little little Isabella, who's just, you know, one of her love languages is touch. She just loves cuddles. So, you know, halfway through the night, Grandma, Grandma. Two steps into bed with me, you know. So it was like, it was delightful. But, you know, we have those seasons. Sometimes I'm in a season sometimes when I'm, I'm picking up my dad's walker and I'm putting it in the boot and buckling him into his car seat. And the next minute, I'm buckling my grandchild into the car seat at the back and putting her buggy in the boot. And it's like, you know, what a funny world this is. It's just like the, 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 the two extremes of life. And, uh, you know, and I have that privilege, I guess. You know, it's just a... Uh, anyway, the truth is you can't do it all, girls. I want to say that. And you don't need to do it all. Because there are seasons where we can be freer to do what God's called us to do. When we understand the season, we know that summer will follow spring. And just as surely as we know that a day follows a night, the Bible's clear, while the earth remains, so will seasons come and seasons go. And you might think that you're in, you know, like you're an overwhelmed season. Well, just no, it's a, it's a season. It's not the permanent place. I, I had, um, you know, when my mum died, I had a season of grief all over again. And I felt the Holy Spirit whisper to me in that time because it was a hard work time for me because I'd I entered that season at the end of a year in December already tired because we had had such a full year of ministry and life. And then my mum goes and dies on me, you know, right in the midst of me being tired. <laughs> and so, you know, I spent two weeks in hospital backwards and forwards as well as caring for my dad because my brother lives in Australia. I have my one brother, but he's not in New Zealand. So... The responsibility is mine and um, so you know in this process and it was just like and then you know when mum died dad was no, able, no longer able to care for himself so we had to put him into um, work the process of getting him cared for and that meant then I had to pack up the house and sort through all their things and, uh, you know, it, it just breaks your heart. I'm just sitting there as I'm sorting through stuff by myself for three weeks, crying as I'm doing it, because everything that you're sorting has a memory and it has a reason for being there in my mum's life. And it's, you know, um, and so by the time we, we get back to, um, I get back home and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a very emotionally vulnerable place. And so people would come and I would just cry. And they'd not seen me like that. I'm quite strong. You know, I'm quite, usually I'm strong. I'm usually together. But for this season, it was, it was a crying place for me. And it was like the Holy Spirit whispered to me in this season. And he said, be kind to yourself. Like he gave me permission to be vulnerable. He gave me permission not to have it together. He gave, you know, and so when people would come and I would cry and they'd say, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. I said, yeah, I know, <laughs> but right now I'm crying. <laughs> I know it will, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about getting to that place yet. I'm actually in this moment feeling really sad. I'm actually at this moment struggling. I'm actually grieving and it's okay for me to grieve. Because grieving is, it's, you know, we, we don't like grieving sometimes with people because you don't know what to do with it. People don't know how to handle you <laughs> when you're grieving sometimes. They'll walk to the other side of the road because they don't know what to say to you. They'll, you know, and all, you, you don't need to say anything. All you need to do is just come and put your heart, arms around somebody and just be there. It's just a being place sometimes. And so, you know, I, I love it, the fact that God, God gives us permission at times to know the season that we're in and not to expect, I, you know, I, I turned down ministry opportunities in that season because I thought I actually have to nurture my own soul here. I have to nurture my physical state. I have to nurture this person because this is the season I'm in. And if I try and be what I was before in this season, it's something's going to give. And um, actually, God was so gracious because I turned 60 last year. And uh, when Steve had, um, was trying to do it secretly, but he had planned that he would take me on a cruise for my 60th birthday. And in the end, he actually had to tell me because you just can't take that amount of money out of a bank account. And I'm the one who does the finances. <laughs> 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 
but I, you know, I just looked back and I just thought, God, you're amazing. So that the, the cruise that we went on began in February. So my mum had died in December. I had all the house and stuff to sort in December, January. In February, God placed me on a boat in the middle of nowhere where everything was taken care of for me. I didn't have to think about cooking a meal. I didn't have to think about making my bed. I, you know, if Steve wanted to do stuff, he could go do stuff and he would ask me, do you want to come? No. I'm, and I slept. Honestly, I slept for days. And, and I didn't want to see people. And it's, you, you might think that's funny when you're on a cruise ship with, you know, a thousand other people, but you didn't have to interact if you didn't want to. And, you know, he would say, do you want to go sit with those people for dinner? And I'd say, no. <laughs> you know, and that's not me normally. You know, you, you know you're not well when you don't want to do things that you know aren't, aren't naturally who you are. But, you know, God restored me in that place. He brought me to a place of healing. He let me rest in that place. He brought strength back into my body. He brought recovery back into my soul. And, you know, I just love how God does understands us and when we give ourselves permission with God's permission to understand the season we're in and then we can work with it um, so there are the Bible also shows that not only are there seasons in the natural but there are seasons in our life Ecclesiastes 3 1 says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven I, we were taking our grandkids um, for a walk down the beach and we've got this beach at New Plymouth called Back Beach and it's got this monster of a sand hill that, um, you know, like twice the height of this building it starts and, it, and there's a sand hill that races right down to the beach. And back in the day, I would be up with everybody else to race down that sand hill. But the Bible is true. There are seasons for everything. And I thought, if, <laughs> if this woman tries to do something silly and tear down that sand hill now, like she used to, something serious could happen. Something could get broken somewhere. Fortunately, there are stairs, zigzag stairs that go down to get you to the same location. So, you know, whilst the young ones went for it down the sand hill, I just thought, there's a season for me to take the stairs. I'm taking the stairs. You know, we, we need to be wise about the season we were at. And uh, in the, the Bible talks about fruit coming in seasons. In, in Psalm 1, it said, Blessed is the one who does not walk in, the, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Can I say, girls, when we put ourselves in the word of God, we will, no matter what season, we will find life. And that's part of the thing that God has, God's word has sustained me through all sorts of seasons, even the hard seasons, just one word sometimes. And that can last for years. <laughs> you know, that one word can see you through a whole bunch of things. In Psalm 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger, talking about God, lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. You know, when you're going through a season of grief, yes, there's weeping, but it's only a season. I'm not crying like I was a year ago. <laughs> Thankfully for everybody else, you know. But, um, and that's okay. Because that was the season. And yes, yes, there are times that kind of catch you by surprise and tears come again. But it's not like it was. You see, there are seasons and they come. They, weeping can come for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Uh, rainy days come in seasons. We have a few rainy days in Taranaki. That's why we're so green all the time. That's why our dairy farmers like our grass growing there. In Jeremiah 5, it says, But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They've turned aside and gone away. They do not say to themselves, Let us fear the Lord, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, and who assures us of regular weeks of harvest. You see, the thing is, rainy days come in season, and it's God's season. We need to understand that. And if you're feeling dry and barren, you need to know that there will be a rainy day that comes, because God will, he's ordered a season for us. 
In Ezekiel 34, 26, it says, I'll make them and the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in season and there will be showers of blessing. Prophetic words are fulfilled in seasons. In Luke 1, 20, and it says, And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. That was when Elizabeth was pregnant. And uh, what was her husband's name? I forgot to write it down. Zechariah. Zechariah didn't believe. And all of a sudden he was made dumb. And, it, and God said, you know, <laughs> this prophetic word is going to happen. <laughs> I've spoken it. And you, you'll discover it's the truth. And you'll be able to speak again when it comes to pass. It has its season of fulfillment. And Habakkuk 2 and 3 talks about the vision coming to pass in an appointed time and in its right season. It talks about the vision is yet for the appointed time. You know, you, God might have given you a picture of something that's part of your life and you think, I haven't seen that yet. Well, maybe because it's not yet the time for it. Maybe it's because it's not yet the right time. Don't give up on what God says just because it's not happened yet. Don't give in and just say, oh, it's never going to happen. Well, you, you're not dead yet, are you? <laughs> Somebody is dead in the room? Oh, just, just, <laughs> just checking. Good. That's good. It's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. <clears throat> in fact, the Bible also says there are seasons of heaviness as well as seasons of rejoicing. And in, in 1 Peter 1 6, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now. Though now, for a little while, you'll have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Who'd like that as a prophetic word? <laughs> you know. But it's life. And sometimes life happens. And who knows? Like I shared with the girls last night, I, we, we, I was sitting on my front veranda enjoying my beautiful park garden. And, you know, being stunned at God's goodness. And the phone rings and one of our church members had just committed suicide. It was just like... That completely changed how I saw that day. It seems that God has, in his wisdom, punctuates all of life with seasons. Through these next winter months, we'll probably more likely face seasons of hot soup, <laughs> maybe seasons of ills and chills, seasons of dark and wet weather, seasons of isolation, seasons of barren countrysides. But you know, the good news is that even in the midst of these seasons, we know that there's a spring going to be coming. In fact, I'm looking at our garden in the natural yesterday, and I said to Steve, already like the freesia bulbs, which are spring flowers, they're already coming up. I'm thinking, we haven't even really started winter yet, and these freesias are turning up. You know, what's with that? But it, you know, I just, I love it because freesias are some of my favorite flowers. I love them. And there's a promise, even as I enter this winter dark season, there's a promise of a fragrance yet to come. There's a promise of, of something that's going to change. This is not, you know, winter is not the permanent season. And I want to talk a little bit now about um, bridging seasons in our lives. And, uh, you know, when we think about what a bridge is built for, it's bridge is built to span some kind of an obstacle that otherwise is not easy to cross. You know, we've got quite a few rivers, I've noticed, as we come to here, we, we're going across a few bridges around the place. <clears throat> and I, I think we need to see the bridge for our seasons as a picture of what spans something that's been a past reality and carries us into an unknown future. And when I look back and I reflect on transitions from one season in my life to another, sometimes it's this time in the middle that I need a bridge to take me over this obstacle of uncertainty. As a woman, change can happen. You know, you can be independent and single and then you maybe get married or you, you can happen as, it can happen when a child enters a family or maybe you have a, a health issue and all of a sudden, you know, you... Um, you become, you lose a leg or an accident happens and you, you, you don't have the same capacity to live. Change happens just like that. And change can happen when your kids all leave home. I was talking with one of the girls about when our, 
when we shifted to New Plymouth, it was a, a really interesting season because we had four children and they'd all been living at home. One of our daughters, when we moved, it was at university in Palmerston North. The second, the, the, our oldest son, we left him behind in Hawara because he was doing an apprenticeship, so he had to stay behind. And we took our youngest two with us. And within two and a half years, those two had both left home and gone. One, one to Palmerston North to university and one to um, Wellington to live and then to London. And in that same season, the dog died of old age and the cat got run over. <laughs> so it was empty nest in every aspect of the word. There was not a thing except Steve and I looking at each other thinking, here we are. Our life has so changed. You see, we've, um, it was one thing that I learned from a, a, a great mentor of mine and a friend, Joy, Pastor Joy Greats. And she said that every season has contained within it an, an assignment. And even though the seasons change and our assignments can change, our call will never change. What are you called to be? You're called to be a lover of God. You're called to be a daughter of the Most High. You're called, some of you have got giftings on your life that you're called to be. I was called to ministry. What did that look like through the different seasons of my life? I was not always called to the assignment of being on the platform as a platform minister. But all through my life, I've had a desire to want to serve God even in my failure places, you know. But God will place things around about you. And changes of season are never comfortable. I don't know about you, but, you know, when you have a change of season, you, you never know how many layers of clothes to wear because, you know, you can start out the day thinking it's going to be this and then the next minute it's, you know, a, a, it's changed and, you know. And I vividly recall leaving that small town of Carterton in the Wairarapa in our early married life. And thinking that I had no idea what I was going into. This was a change of season. And I thought it was the wrong change. And the wrong time. And the wrong season to be doing what we were doing. But you see God is amazing. And he had to teach me how to trust him. And that, so when he said to me. I can do more with your submission to your husband's mistake. Than I can do with your rebellion. I had to realize that I had to stop rebelling against the change of season. And go with God who was in charge of the season. And uh, I recognize that I'm, I'm not so crash hot at navigating that time in the middle, that, that transition time. But, you know, we can put our trust in God that whatever season he's got us in right now and whatever season he's taking us into, he is in charge of the season. There were two men in the Bible who were in this time in the middle and they were walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And Jesus, the Messiah, the one they'd followed and hoped and had been crucified. And to them, this season was way too much to cope with. Their hope, their perspective and their future seemed lost as they talked together on a journey that was taking them away from where God wanted them positioned. And I love how Jesus came to these two men in this disillusioned place to journey with them. And he restored and he rebuilt their faith in the bigger picture as he shared scripture with them. And their purpose was restored. And immediately they turned around and went back again. You know, I've learned not to say I wish I was in a different season. I've learned not to say I wish I was that. Or I wish I will be there. You know, I, I've learned not to wish my life away. I've learned to look at where I am and say, God, I thank you for the season I'm in. And I think it's really important that we stop and fully embrace, fully embrace the time that we're in. And I've just asked Ruth to get me some paper. And if I could just hand those pieces of paper around. I want you to do a wee exercise for me as we come to a close. And uh, what I'd like you to do, and it, it matters not what kind of an artist you are. This is not an artistic skill test. But on this little piece of paper, I want you to draw a picture of what your life looks like in this season that you are in right now. What does your life look like in the season that you are right now? So I'm going to give you five minutes to just put that onto a piece of paper. So you're going to draw a picture 
of what your life looks like in the season that you are right now. What I'd love you to do now is I'd love you to get in twos or threes and share your picture with each other. And uh, you don't have to, I mean, but I prefer that because I think that, that helps us understand one another. And um, so I'm not going to organise you into that. You, girls, you organise yourselves into pairs or threes. One, two, three, go! <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. So that's really impressive. They really look like people, gosh. <laughs> As opposed to something I would try to create, which would not. What I would love you to do now as we finish, is I want you to pray for these girls that you've just been sharing. I want you to pray into their season. I want you to pray God's grace into the season that they're in right now. And uh, let's just trust God that he's going to give you an encouraging word for one another because we're in this life together, girls. And if we can understand without judgment the season that we're in, we will have God speak to us to encourage one another in the season that we're in. All right? So I'm going to give you another five minutes to pray for one another in that place. Well, ladies, thank you so much for um, allowing me the privilege of sharing with you. Let's just close in prayer and just let, let's just say thank you, God, for the season I'm in. You know, we, we, it starts there. Give thanks in all things. So, Father, we thank you today. God, you know us so uniquely. You know the journey we've traveled on. You know the journey we've got ahead. And we thank you that you've got us where we are right now in the palm of your hand and you know us so wonderfully and you care for us so particularly. And I pray that as, our, uh, as we leave this place today, God, we come to a new appreciation of the fact that you hold our future, you hold our present and you hold our past. And God, I thank you that you are the one who is in charge. We give you permission to be in charge of the season that we're in. And we bless you today, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Pip. Well, look at that. It's three minutes to 12. Three minutes left, ladies. What can we do? <laughs> Oh dear. Hey? Eh? What? <laughs> uh, but I hope that God's really spoken to you today. Uh, maybe about different things. Uh, we're all in different seasons of our life, no matter what age we are, no matter what stage we are. We're all somewhere in the seasons that God has placed us in at this time. So I hope you've got something from it. Um, we have recorded PIP sessions, so if you did want to listen to them again, we can get them to you somehow. I think they're on a stick, so <laughs> work out how we can get them to you. But if you would like to listen to them or, you know, someone who couldn't come today who may like to listen to them, that would be good. Um, just ask Lundy about the food that's left down there. If you want to, you can take some with you. Take it home for your husband or say if you're making lunch or <laughs> whatever if you have to or take some home to kids, etc. So you're quite welcome to do that. But that's it for the day. I hope you've um, got a lot out of it. And uh, I think the real precious time is just coming aside like this for um, three hours. I've done it this morning. It's amazing what you can cover in three hours and how much God can speak to you in three hours, isn't it? About different things. So bless your heaps. It's a beautiful day out there. So you'll have to go home and go out and enjoy the day, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Bless your heaps. <laughs>